Good morning, colleagues, and uh, welcome to the final session uh, of this series of talks on why environmental management must become the new normal. We're going to give uh, some of our colleagues, as I do see the numbers in the room increasing by the second, uh, a minute or so to just uh, make their way into the room, uh, and then we will proceed. Uh, as mentioned, our speakers are ready to go, so I don't foresee any delays, uh, but let's give our, our colleagues who are joining from many parts of the country and world uh, a minute or, or two more, uh, and I don't foresee us starting beyond 11.02. Good morning, colleagues, uh, and welcome again to the uh, grand finale, uh, the cherry on the top, uh, to our series on why environmental management uh, must become the new normal. Uh, on behalf of my co-host, uh, Aliza Leroux, uh, Sage, uh, Asaf, and, and all of those that have been along with us, including the Institute of Natural Resources on this journey uh, over the last four weeks. We welcome you to the last session. And uh, we wanted to go big in the last session. And that's why we've invited on board two uh, highly acclaimed uh, keynote speakers, um, and I wanted to devote some time to actually uh, allowing you to appreciate uh, their areas of expertise. And I want to begin with Prof. Tolu Oni, um, or Tolula. Uh, we, we all affectionately call her Tolu, uh, 
but she is actually Tallulah Oni and is joint lead of the Global Diet and Activity Research Group uh, based at the University of Cambridge, honorary associate professor at the University of Cape Town and founder and principal of Urban Better. Uh, as a public health physician and urban epidemiologist, her work supports a coordinated approach between science, policy, and societal role players, identifying creative and long-term strategies to address complex urban health challenges in rapidly growing cities. She has served as scientific advisor for several organizations, including Future Earth and the International Science Council, and is an editorial board member of Lancet Planetary Health, Cities and Health, and the Journal of Urban Health. Um, when I joined the South African Young Academy of Sciences, uh, Tolu was one of those that I certainly looked up to. And it is indeed my pleasure and my privilege to give the floor now to Tolu, who will be talking to us on harnessing urban systems for planetary health equity. Given the Code Red report that was released only a week ago, as well as the increasing dialogue around how climate risk is now spoken about in the same breath as urban risk, I am really looking forward to this talk. Colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Prof. Talula Oni. Thank you, thank you, Sershan, for the very kind words, and I am um, glad you mentioned it there because I realise a critical omission from my uh, bio that I shared was a proud alumna of the South African Young Academy of Science, so let that uh, be on the record. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, we've been warned and instructed to let um, to follow no rules and just to kind of let it rip for this. So the first thing I did was change the title um, from what was uh, what was uh, advertised um, slightly. So I am talking about harnessing urban systems for health. Uh, planetary health equity, uh, breaking that down, it really is the, the components of urbanization, climate change, and health, because that's the nexus that I, that I work within, which I've termed here a planetary syndemic. So over the next um, uh, half an hour or so, I'll kind of explain, uh, explain why. And I really look forward to your, uh, to your questions afterwards. So first kicking off with cities, um, why focus on cities? I should say the majority of my work focuses um, in, in the African continent with some work in, in Latin America um, and the Caribbean. Um, but this image here that you first see shows us why um, particularly in Asia and Africa cities is are so critical and why focusing on urban health in these places is going to be vital for global health. So what you can see here is that looking at each of the regions, whilst uh, many of the regions start from a high baseline, the rate of increase um, in urbanization, particularly in Asian Africa, is going to be or is already phenomenal and way over the, um, the global average. So put another way, and I like this because it really brings it to brings it home um, to bear. You can see this, the map shows the number of people moving into these cities per hour. So the hourly growth of these cities. So if you compare um, 11 people per hour in New York, 10 people per hour in London, seven in Paris, to 56 in Lagos, let's so on, on, on the, so in South Africa, we're starting off from a much higher baseline in terms of the um, proportion of people living in, in, in cities. Um, 
but the growth really across the continent, um, the Asian continent and the African continent is, is huge and really unparalleled. So really, I would argue that there are five, at least five reasons why um, we need this planetary health focus in cities and why it's so critical. So the first is that many parts of the world are rapidly transforming into urban areas. So by 2050, um, almost 70% of people globally uh, are projected to be living in cities. And, and this pace, as I mentioned, is, is happening particularly rapidly in, in, in Africa. The second is that we know that urban spaces can amplify and reduce health or reduce health risks. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The third is that we know that the expanding um, cities uh, across the globe are a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and ecological disruption that can both accelerate climate change and biodiversity loss. So this is a spectrum of, of planetary health. Fourth, we know that a lot of the significant to more than half of global energy use happens in cities. And lastly, and we see this particularly with the more, more presently with the, with the pandemic, is the cities are disproportionately impacted by climate induced disruptions um, that can result in destruction of infrastructure, it can result in health related emergencies that can then further um, threaten uh, health in, the, in a vicious cycle. But over the course of the talk, I hope we can convert you around to seeing how we can make that um, into a much more virtuous cycle. And the last thing I would add is that it's also really critical because of the high concentration of young people in cities. So the population populations in cities tend to be younger. Um, and we know that the exposures and behaviors and health um, in, in at younger ages are um, play a critical role in future adult health. So compromising early exposures can, can further compound um, health inequalities later on. So when I when I start to, so that's a kind of bigger picture in urban systems. When I kind of want to then break that down to say, well, what are the different components? How we, when we start thinking about how that interaction between urban, urbanization, climate change and health, how do we break up those different components? And I know normally when we think about cities, we think about tall buildings, we think about density, we think about lots of activity, but I like to break it down into, and one way of taking it back is into the, uh, you know, Plato's elements, you know, I know they're not all elements, but um, fire, earth, uh, air and water. So if you think about the very basic things that we need to live, because a lot of these um, activities are a combination of things that um, uh, uh, well, are grounded in things that we know we need to live, right? So on one hand, we think about those basic elements that we're exposed to. And on the other hand, we think about um, what the ways in which our activities are shaping um, those environments. So in the African context, particularly in the context in, in thinking about sprawl and informality, thinking about growth and patterns of, of migration. So critical to understand well how these elements themselves interact, um, also how they metabolize, how, how urbanization metabolizes element, these elements into environments. So I, I like to think about that. So if you think about um, energy, energy is, you know, metabolizing fire and air and a bit of water. If you think about land systems, um, um, we essentially metabolizing all of those different elements together into environments. So in addition to thinking about how these elements interact, we need to think about how they, their impact interact um, and how, um, how the elements interact with the health impact and how exposures and impact can be harnessed particularly for, for health. Um, I'll go into each, each, each one of these. So, um, so we wouldn't, so I wouldn't going through it so much here, but essentially we have, uh, particular, particularly in this context, as this is unique to, to urbanization, we have um, the ways that we're um, uh, 
metabolizing the land um, for housing, for food production, for healthcare, for into public space, for transport mobility. All of these things determine the exposures, these environments that we're exposed to that have a play a critical role in um, in 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 that, in our health and also play a really critical role in the in the um, in the environment. So. Oh, the last thing I would say before I go into the next slide is that across all of these, it's really critical, and this will be a recurring point, to think about the different dimensions of equity. So I'd like you to bear in the back of your mind four dimensions of equity across everything I'm saying. So equity with respect to exposure, susceptibility, access to care and information, and consequence. And if you even if you look at something like the pandemic that we um well, going through the moment, if you look at those dimensions of equity, we can see that across populations, even within countries, within cities, we see this playing out very differentially. So who is more likely to be exposed? Who was more susceptible going into the pandemic? Who has access to care, access to reliable information? And who bears um, a significant negative consequence, both of the public health measures that are necessary and of ill health? So let's bear that in the back of our minds. Moving on then from urban systems to planetary health. The idea for this is not for you to follow it <laughs> because it is, uh, I call this my spider diagram, but it really is to illustrate how interlinked um, all of these elements and environments are in terms of how they impact um, climate, how they impact environments and how they impact health. So for example, you know, we have urbanization contexts that generate hazards to, to health, like if we think about food and walkability, think about access to water, sanitation, healthcare, um, a uh, huge sprawl would have implications on, on commute and transport and emissions related to that and mental health. Um, in the context of all of that is happening in the context of, of climate change. So if you look at the, the red bubble in the context of um, climate and the environment, if we think about how is that playing out, how, is, how would these impact on climate change and ecolog ecological disruption? So if we follow, say, one, so let's follow food, for example, you can see how food impacts on, um, uh, has implications for our transport systems, the so way you go get food, whether you're a producer or, and or consumer, um, the energy used for food, the, um, your access to, to healthy foods. Each of these have implications for the transport systems, have implications for how physically active you are, um, how connected you are um, to your community, your risk of injury, both outdoors and indoors, um, your exposure to, to air pollution um, and your, your food security. And those, each of those then have implications for different um, um, health hazards. So that, gives you a sense of, you know, when we talk about uh, food and we talk about built environment, we, we really can't talk about these in, in isolation. So we have to think about how these environments interact, etc. The other thing to, to realize is that as we are, so what is illustrated with these arrows is that to some extent, um, going from left to right, we look at what we what we need as human beings, so how we our day to day activities, but the consequences play out bi directionally. So um, it's not just going from left to right. So the implications for ill health has implications for the environment, has implications for for um, for climate, etc. And as we move from from left to right, the impact of acute shocks and chronic stressors that are further um, um, accelerated by these activities are even greater. But the potential for partnership and equity to address that balance are equally great. So let's illustrate the plan planetary syndemic further. So I said at the beginning that I would, um, that I'd rename this a uh, uh, planetary uh, syndemic. We can see how rapid population growth and urban sprawl 
increased climate hazards, how climate change intensifies the risk of conflict driven by uh, increasing uh, scarcity of resources, um, be that land or water or food, and we see that already playing out across the continent. Um, that ensuing uh, socio-political conflict and unrest can increase the risk of displacement into um, uncertain and precarious um, settlement. You have inadequate housing conditions uh, that push the boundaries of human settlements, right? Disrupting ecology and further increasing exposure to acute shocks like floods and also risk of emergence of new diseases, but also chronic stressors like thermal discomfort, dampness, flooding, indoor air pollution, contributing to a wide range of things from ill health to biodiversity loss um, to the emergence of new, new diseases. The biodiversity loss can limit the effect, effectiveness of climate change, um, climate mitigation adaptation action, whilst negatively impacting health. The dislocation uh, can reduce access to health care and disrupt routine access, routine care across the life course to think about from, from um, immunizations in children to chronic uh, medication in, in, in adults. The regularity of epidemics and extreme weather events can increase food insecurity. Natural disasters can disrupt uh, built environments in ways that um, impact access to spaces that are conducive for physical activity for, for everyone, um, particularly if you depend on use of public space. So you can start to, I'm, I'm trying to weave this into a narrative so you can start to see how, again, this, this syndemic, it, it really is impossible to, to separate these out. And you see how the logic of having these in silos to say, oh, there are people working just on climate change, oh, there's people just working on health, of course, we need people working in these spaces, but these the interlinkages between the risks um, related to climate and related to health and related to urbanization are so um, fundamental that we we need much more of this endemic um, approach to thinking about them all together. Um, and really are trying to understand. So it's one thing to understand the epidemiology of particular diseases in cities, but the reason I call myself an urban epidemiologist is because that, that moves away from just talking about um, epidemiology of disease, but bringing in the epidemiology of the syndemic. So we're recognizing that the diseases don't occur just in isolation, but we, we have to look at how the interaction with the environment um, plays um, plays uh, plays out in different contexts. Again, remembering the context, the four dimensions of equity that I mentioned earlier. And then in thinking about this, I highlighted these three points just to think about um, the, the ways, some of the ways that I'm starting to think about is so how can we can think about hazards that are created by climate change and influence health? How can we think about urbanization related risk to health? And the intersection of all of those, bearing in mind the, the differential spread of socio environmental vulnerability. Okay, are you still with me? I'm going to take that as yes. Yes, so, yes, we will. Going on. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on action, right? So when we talk about then, because it's one thing to think about uh, the interconnectedness and to think about the um, understanding, but then that can be quite overwhelming, right? So where do we even start, you know? So I'm going to focus the rest on, on an action and I'll share with you some of my thoughts and I framed it around the what, the how, um, and the when um, of, of action. And I think the who might be peppered in there um, across the way. So, firstly, in terms of the what, I'm going to think about with frame it around looking at the tensions and interdependencies, and I will do that using um, some case examples from some of some of the work that we've been we've had ongoing. So 
this is an, uh, a case in point for the what and the tensions and interdependencies of climate and health action. So we often talk about the um, inequalities um, between countries um, and between continents, but this I've purposely um, using an example of, of uh, tensions and interdependencies of neighboring communities within the same city and the dangers of, of not considering those interdependencies um, in a disaggregated way within the city. This is Echo Atlantic, so it's an, uh, in, in Lagos. Uh, it's pitched as an eco-friendly smart city. Um, it's built on, on land that's reclaimed from the Atlantic Ocean as indeed huge parts of Lagos are. And um, it's the Great Wall of Lagos has been described, a, a huge sea wall has been built to protect um, against uh, a flooding. But the same wall that will protect Eco Atlantic, this is something that is still in, 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 in construction, could worsen the situation for neighboring areas not protected by the wall which essentially includes much of Lagos. I should mention that the Eco Atlantic is, is a high, um, high income, so it's not a mixed income space. So it's, it's really those who are, who are you know, a, a flat costing a million dollars sort of thing. Um, so if we think about who is protected, so on paper, it looks, sounds like a good idea, right? A smart city, is it good friendly? We have, we've thought about flood risks, we're future proofed, but actually when we don't consider the differential um, dimensions of inequity within the city, um, you have these, these issues. So there's two potential um, inter interdependencies and tensions here. The one is adjacent flood flooding risk, and we're already seeing, so the areas around the Eco Atlantic already have um, a higher risk of flooding that has been increasing um, over the years. And this is whilst there is no, um, there's not studies as yet directly correlating the, the wall to flooding, you can see how that wall can only make it worse. So increasing the flooding risks of those in the majority <laughs> of, of the city and particularly those who are already vulnerable. And then the second um, uh, issue is that it, it has taken up and essentially privatized significant aspects of, um, of, of public space that, uh, that quite a lot of the city depend on for physical activity, for recreation, et cetera. So if, we, if you kind of follow through the potential social and health impact of, of privatizing public space, which is already um, uh, hard to come by, um, uh, you can start to see, and this is space used for physical activity, used for social events, etc. So you can start to see how the social and health implications of not considering the interdependencies and, and not taking an equity um, approach um, is really a huge, significant missed opportunity for an integrated governance approach that could have been adopted. So that could have taken a, a more participatory community-based approach to understand what the, what the issues are, what the community concerns are, what the health needs are, indeed what the assets are, and to actually design something that is cognizant of all of those. So that kind of approach would have considered the feedback loops and the, the social and environmental and health consequences indeed of the wider population. And it would have then designed um, this in a way that can mitigate against and adapt to the realities of, of both climate change and, and urbanization both today and in the future. So, and I remember this is a city that is already low lying, it's already coastal. So the impacts of rapid sea level rise, heat risks, displacement, food supplies are already huge and significant. So the what in the what of action, if not considering those tensions and dependencies, not considering the equity, is um, unlikely or will definitely not um, do anything for the pre-existing health, social, economic inequalities um, that are already playing out in the city. So 
So that's a bit on the what. In terms of the how, um, this is, I, I, actors, agencies, agency and accountability is, is my mnemonic for thinking about integrated governance. So when we think about, if we want to talk, talk about how to how to go about this, um, I find this a helpful um, helpful mnemonic to think about. So actors in terms of both who is implementing and who is benefiting, agency in terms of whether the actors are can can do what they set out to do, and accountability again because of the um, whether or not that feedback loop is there. So if we first consider um, the actors in this space. Um, say using the previous example, who was involved in design and implement, implement, implementation of that, of that project? Who funded? What degree of evaluation um, is, was in place to understand the impact of, of the activities on, on um, climate risk and on health? Who is ensuring that benefit is accrued fairly and that cost um, be that financial or socioeconomic or health-wise is not borne um, unduly by those already more vulnerable. How do you ensure that these, um, these interventions are not solely conceptualized as a top-down approach? Uh, how do you ensure that there's a centralized, um, that equity, dimensions of equity, are a critical part of, 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 of these actions? And really key to that is, is power. So, and, and we see this a lot with climate action more generally, right? So who, who are we asking to change behavior? Um, are, we, are we focused on changing behavior of the powerful or are we more fo focused on changing behavior of those actually who are, who are powerless or much less powerful? Where, are, where, where do we identify knowledge as coming from so how diverse are our knowledge sources do we um, identify um, local experts and people on the ground who are actually whose lived experiences um, mean they have knowledge that cannot be um, accrued any other way and is that factored in and critically where and this is particularly in the African context where is the youth, uh, the youth in all of this? And this is something I will keep repeating. I often say that I have a, um, I have a love-hate relationship with the word youth um, in the context, particularly in the context of the African continent, because globally, you know, youth, th that word is, it, it implies a separate, so you have the population and then you have this niche group of youth, right? So we're doing something and then we have, and now let's hear the youth voice. Okay, great, that's great. And we'll think about that. But when you are on the continent where the median age is 19, it's not a niche group, it's just the average person, right? So should we be calling, should we be talking about youth in, 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 in the African context? Or should we just be, should that be the default, right? So should it just be the average person and have the other um, age groups as um, as the niche group, so can we get a voice from older persons? Um, <laughs> um, can you can you imagine can you imagine flipping that round? And why is that so ridiculous when when we live on a continent that is so young? Um, I'll park that. Um, in terms of agency, what are the features within the systems that the actors work within that can either facilitate or hinder? Um, action that is integrated and that is equitable. So how are incentives, how, how do incentives and performance indicators align with the desired impact? And we see this a lot really across society. We, what we say and what we do and what we measure are two very different things. Um, I had some work um, a few years ago in, in South Africa looking at the potential for integrating health into human settlements um, policy and had some fantastic partners um, within, the, within the government in that space. And part of the reason we co-designed this research project together, and one of the reasons they were interested is, 
is that they said, you know, we know what we do matters for health. Of course, we know housing matters for health, but it's just not what we're it's not what we're um, measured against, right? So in terms of our measures of success, no one says, you know, congratulations, you helped reduce um, um, hospitalizations from asthma because of that fantastic work you did and on, on, on damp building new damp, uh, house, um, less damp houses. No one does that, right? Because we don't, our incentives, how, how, um, how performance is measured is still in these silo spaces. So you can see how if you're working in those spaces, of course you have to work to your to your performance indicators. So how can we start thinking about that? Um, we can't ask people to do without aligning and shifting the system against which within which they are operating. So how do we increase the agency um, of, of people working in that space? And lastly, accountability, and obviously these are all inter interrelated. What are the accountability mechanisms um, that are in place? Um, really critically, these need to have the data systems integrated, right? Um, um, and institutional processes that enable um, anyone to hold sectors accountable um, for actions that either protect or undermine health. So one example, one of my favorite examples at the moment is work that I, um, is this piece that I read about, I had nothing to do with, done about, um, I think about 10 years ago in, in Wales. So they looked at, um, they were looking, they were looking to upgrade a whole bunch of their um, housing stock for their social, social um, housing. Um, and they sought to, they wanted to understand what the potential health impacts of that upgrade would be. So they, um, I should have put the details on, on, on that of the paper, I'm happy to share that later. And they looked at, um, so they detailed the different interventions in terms of the housing upgrades, it's a combination of ventilation, lighting, energy and thermal comfort, looking at points of injury and access to, to, to public space, et cetera. Um, so broke that down and then looked at, over a 10 year period, looked at um, hospitalizations. So presentations of emergency for varying conditions. And they found that over a 10 year period, those who had significant exposure to the upgraded housing that, with the upgrades deliberately thinking about um, uh, thinking about health, had a forty percent reduction in presentation to emergency. Forty percent. So when we talk about um, health healthcare systems being overburdened, when we talk about and of course we need significantly greater investment and budgets for healthcare sector, but we have to ask ourselves what are we doing at the same time to reduce that load and to reduce that baseline need. And particularly in cities across um, the African continent where we have these, uh, these cities being built so rapidly and the opportunity to affect significant long-term um, impact on health is significant, but we're not as yet and at scale taking advantage of that opportunity. And in doing so, we have to remember that, you know, and the challenge of the accountability is often our systems are aligned for very short term impact. So, you know, can you tell me within a, a funding cycle or within a political cycle, can you show me the impact? It's like, well, that example I just gave was a 10 year, you know, over 10 years. So when we're thinking about climate and health, we have to remember that there are immediate efforts that will have short lived impacts. So for example, you know, clear the drains so that if we have flash floods, we don't have immediate flood, um, flooding of housing. There are immediate efforts that have sustained impact. So if we say, okay, rather than just clear the drains, we're expanding the drainage system as part of a flood response that we reduce the risk of future floods um, and reduce breeding grounds for, for, for vectors. And there are long-term efforts um, that can have sustained impacts. So for example, the example I just gave, how can you think about safe housing and green spaces can both mitigate against climate um, risk and help reduce the risk of disease, both in the short term, like reducing um, 
uh, disrupting uh, disease transmission, but also in the longer term, like increasing physical activity, access to green space and cardiovascular risk and mental health. This is another example thinking about an integrated governance in adaptation from, for, for climate and health. Again, and this is another example from Lagos. Um, and so this is, Ajayi Kourdou is, um, is a low income um, area community with um, uh, quite a lot of informal, informal settlements. Um, I should say before going in there, um, in the recently, I think it was launched last year, the state, Lagos State, developed a resilience um, plan um, for the city. And so this was part of developing the action plan for the city, um, working with different communities. And they sought to understand from the communities what the key issues are, again, in terms of their resilience, the approaches that they've taken to to adapt um, to those. And one of the things they found was that uh, the community had learned to live with the floods. So they, we have, you know, annually, it comes at particular times and they've adopted different coping strategies. You know, they move, they know at certain points of the year to move assets to places in the community less prone to flooding, um, the seasonal migration, families relocate outside of the community where that is when they're not able to move up, the use of canoes for navigating because you know that's coming, sandbags to reduce storm water, um, local the construction of bridges as walkways in the short term, and really critically social capital and agency um, is really critical. One of the things that struck me um, in, so this work was done by the state in partnership with um, collaborators of, of ours at, at the University of Lagos. And one of the things that struck me is that even in this, I, I thought this was exemplary in terms of trying to understand um, what was mitigation and adaptation already happening within the community. But even within these spaces, um, there was still a siloing in terms of climate, uh, climate and health. So I asked, well, where is the, you know, what happens? It came up in passing that, you know, the primary care clinic within the community also often gets flooded. And I thought, well, where is the data? We bring it together data on, say, diarrhea um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and the flooding. Could increasing cases in, in, in childhood diarrhea be an early marker of increasing flooding? Um, could, could that help guide the response um, in terms of the healthcare and preparation and, and so that the healthcare system is more responsive? Does that inform where we, we think about um, the climate risk when we locate clinics um, within these communities? Or do, because if you're building a new a clinic, are you thinking about that rather than just having to react to the clinic as flooded? So these are kind of things that you realize that when we're not thinking about the interactions between um, both the, the urban climate risk and health, we miss the opportunity um, to put in place these early warning systems and to be responsive and to mitigate against um, health risks down the line. So the last point of when, um, you know, the answer is always now, right? But um, that doesn't always, that doesn't really ever um, happen. Um, I came across this, um, you know, uh, this term of uh, this notions of time, right? Um, because I was frustrated by the fact that for something so urgent, we never seem to have, have uh, time for it, right? So be that um, pandemic preparedness, be that climate action, there's always a reason not to do it now. And in my work in urban health, are we looking at bringing different sectors together? It's, you know, there's always, well, you know, we don't do it this way. That's not kind of how it's done. Why does this department want our data? What, that's not how, you know, and there's just all of these stuff that just doesn't seem um, responsive to 
the urgency. And then you have a pandemic. And then suddenly all the different things that we definitely couldn't do because we, because we had to became possible. And so when I was reflecting on this, I found this notion. So the ancient, Greek, ancient, ancient Greeks have two, um, two words for time, right? They had two words for time one is the chronos so we talk about chronological you know the tiktok time we talk about its quantity its duration does it take a year does it take six months does it we have it now so that's the quantity kind of time that we're we're familiar with and the other which is much more complex and much more difficult to pinpoint but i think really prescient is kairos and Kairos is this qualitative time, right? So an opportune time, something that, that happens that can't just happen at any time, you know, a time that marks an, an opportunity that, that can't be guaranteed to recur. Does that all kind of sound familiar to you in terms of your day, our day to day now? And what we do with that time is as critical. So I started thinking about time and as a function of not just chronos, so as, as, Chronos, but also opportunity. And that has really um, informed a lot of the, my approaches and, um, in the last year because there was this window of opportunity. And it's just been, you know, it feels like after years, I feel like you're pushing against the door, right? And then there's somebody on the other end of the door holding their, or several people holding their foot against, and you're just kind of you're pushing with all your might against it. And then suddenly something happens and, and it gives way. And I, I felt like the last year has been kind of this, uh, <laughs> like falling through the door, like because suddenly there's this opportunity because all the different ways that we definitely have to do things have gone, have gone out, of, out of the window. All the things that we definitely couldn't do happened overnight. And albeit for, because we thought it was going to be finite for a short period of time. But the question is that that impossibility and the mindset of impossibility that we've had for so long um, we need to not forget that um, uh, we, need, we need to not forget our reaction uh, to the pandemic and, and when we start thinking about more these complex issues around climate and urbanization and health, let's remember that actually these things are possible. So and ex ex the exigency, so when I looked into the Kairos, um, it sort of have three different components, right? So they're the actors who is playing a role, there is the um, constraints reflecting on what the issues are and how to get over that. But the most um, exciting for me was this exigency. So exigency is that urgency to, to do something about something now, that feeling that you have to stay in this good, good trouble, right? So what are the exigencies in this space? So in this context, that demand urgent action. So in this context, I would say um, the, the exigency really is the urgency for planetary health to become a central organizing, organizing principle for urbanization so that we can pretend, uh, protect uh, Ill, um, ourselves from ill health in the future, but also protect ourselves from, um, uh, from, uh, from the risks that some of our actions um, um, engender and also protect the elements that we depend on. So lastly, thinking about this all together, um, reflected on the, from a health, from a health care and service delivery perspective. How, what are the ways that we can learn from the past and how can we rethink this? So I'll just, you know, share with you some thoughts. I kind of feel like I'm running out of time. I forgot to kind of look at my time. Um, but one of the things that I, um, uh, and this is present for South Africa, every public health um, graduate would know about the Polela experiment. So this is from in the 40s in rural, um, in Polela, um, this, um, I think, yeah, okay, there's a link to that, to the piece, um, around this innovation around thinking differently about healthcare beyond just um, healthcare delivery to thinking about people and communities as a whole. So to understanding what, what comprises the vulnerabilities of a, of a household and to anticipate that uh, to prevent ill health. So I started thinking about how can we think about that going forward in the planetary health context? What would that look like, right? So thinking about the what and the how, could we think about, uh, 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 
community oriented public health and climate care that focuses on intergenerational health um, as well as the health of the planet that integrates but both the environment the environmental risk be that from the urban or from the climate hazards and 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 health outcomes that considers urban urban infrastructure and services that are at risk of disruptions in the context of adaptation, but that also critically has this integrated surveillance of disease that integrates um, disease with socioeconomic determinants of health and environmental risks, and really having a strong early warning system for both imminent um, health threats, but also to prevent um, things that go along. Um, and we already have a sense of how learning from the past. So we know that it'd be critical to leverage community ex expertise and, and actors in that space. Um, we know that uh, it'd be important to understand how ad, um, communities have adapted and how changes to home environments um, over time can influence um, health and can be influenced by urbanization and climate. And really critically, it'd be important that different actors work together with the community. So at the moment, you have this helicoptering in, this funder does this, this ministry does that, and, and it's all happening in the same communities, but it's all not, um, don't, they don't speak to each other. And so I think it's a, it really is about time we think about a Palela 2.0 and and I think if any of this kind of innovation is going to happen, it would be reading from this is where the climate risks are being, being born and being felt. This is where the health and vulnerability and access is being um, challenged on a day to day perspective. So just to end with this um, climate, I feel like I've gone way over time. I'll just, I just wanted to flag this, right? So there's um, Global Health, um, uh, Climate and Health um, Alliance have been um, producing healthy um, NDC scorecards, look at different countries and the extent to which health has, is featured in their climate action commitments. So they look at all of these different things um, that I mentioned here. Um, in the top, um, um, uh in the top country so i say only three countries ndcs um of the 16 that have been looked at uh so far they've been published so far aligned with paris agreement and kenya is is is, is the only other continent if we look at the healthy scorecard the three countries that feature in, from the continent on this are senegal um rwanda um uh, and and kenya so what's happening in south africa um, there's um, so a combination of PASA and SAMA, um, the Global Climate and Health Alliance and AMREF um, a few months ago put out this statement and, and had, and I, I directed to that link, to look at the ways in which, reflecting on South Africa's NDCs, um, the ways in which um, they need to be a lot, a lot uh, stronger in terms of aligning with the Paris Agreement, but also critically having health um, in the center of climate action, because climate is often this kind of ubiquitous uh, abstract thing, but health is something that we all know and we all feel on a day to day basis. So I'll end with this because I talked about community, focus more on community action and the rest of that, but um, from a policy perspective, this is a um, this is a, um, a massive opportunity for governments to build on those ambitious um, emissions targets to reap health benefits as well. So in June last year, the African Development Bank's um, uh, uh, think tanks so of the African Development Institute um, convened um, experts over two days for this policy seminar to look at um, the impacts of COVID on health in Africa and really critically to think about how we could build, um, think forward about building inclusive health um, in the post-COVID Africa. And they developed this, um, published this matrix of policy options that had both short, uh, medium, and long term um, suggestions, um, policy options for those descendants in the memory I'm particularly excited about. So, the suggestion that well, ministers should have a planetary health portfolio that um, urban development and funders should think about themselves as health professionals, that health is actually everybody's business. We know this from the pandemic. There's no country that is dealing with COVID 
pandemic through their Ministry of Health alone and everyone else is back to normal. Um, critically to that we adopt a science-based approach uh, to the development of a, of, of a Marshall Plan um, that evaluates the, the health impacts of, of changes in terms of urbanization and climate to, uh, on our environment and that this informs how we build going forward. Um, that we mobilize different think differently about financing health, you know, in terms of accountability, in terms of the impacts I mentioned, and really critically that we engage the average person on the continent um, uh, and, and privilege those perspectives um, as we start to develop um, and, and build these plans. So this is my last slide um, that I'll leave you. Um, it's a quote from COP17, um, was really uh, provocative, um, that essentially said, well, you know, we're talking about the future here and everyone has got a whole bunch of old white men here. So this, um, this dude said, you know, I'd like to see the next COP. Nobody over 50 allowed in, half of delegates women, at least a quarter people, quarter people under age 25, because this pattern of old men discussing with each other about arcane and sometimes trivial issues when the major issues are really just not addressed is just awful. Uh, I thought that was a really um, provocative, obviously it didn't happen because COP, we're now at COP26, but I think that this last COP17 in, in, in South Africa to remind ourselves of the importance of, of representation, of equity, of inclusion, um, and particularly in the African context, context for that to reflect our, our demographic, which is, you know, we can do a lot with and we are, we are yet to. Thank you, Tolu. Uh, I, I, so I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Tolu. Uh, I think uh, we, we all have lots of food for thought. Uh, I particularly am going a, a, away with uh, a thinking around whether we should move from green cities to fed cities uh, and how we strike the balance between uh, a green city and a fed city. Uh, and particularly the, the idea about going backward yet moving forward. Uh, so learning from the past to deal with the future. Uh, and, and, and this speaks to thinking in the field around, around whether we have been too idealistic in our approach towards achieving sustainability in cities and whether we need to achieve the hybrid between technological and ecological advancement. Uh, what people uh, e e on the continent are now terming techno-sustainability. Uh, so... so uh, Please reference me when you quote the term. <laughs> so uh, we, we, have yeah. two, we have two minutes, colleagues, uh, to, for uh, a question. Uh, and then we have to move on to our next speaker in the interest of time and to give her the opportunity to share her thoughts. So I'm opening it up to the floor for two minutes. So, uh, Tolu, we have a question. Humans struggle to conceptualize climate change and related impacts. How do we effectively communicate and convince role players, private and public sectors, that it is real and must be addressed immediately, inspire and enforce action? So I think it all comes down to the, the, the old challenge about, uh, you know, I don't, think, I don't think we have many denialists left, Tolu, and I'd like to just preface your response with that, uh, but, but how many realists do we have? Yes, I was just going to say that uh, point, thank you. Um, for the question um, that the is cl climate delays that delays um, action, <laughs> right? Rather than I, I think it's it's uh, the, the denial isn't really um, is is no longer a legitimate. Um, it's never been legitimate, but I wouldn't 
even dwell on that. So convincing them is real. I don't think that is a critical issue. The convincing is around that exigency, right? So that, that urgency. And that's why I reflected on that opportunity in time. My reflection is that, you know, one aspect is waiting, um, is pre being prepared so that when opportune opportunity strikes, you're ready to roll, right? So I've <laughs> reflected on that a lot in the last year with the pandemic. And it's been quite a busy year in part because a lot of the work that we've been doing has just been, you know, it's just been marking time and it's just felt really frustrating. And then this window of opportunity opened and we were prepared, right? So some of it is having, um, having that preparation and recognizing that, you know, advancement doesn't, don't always happen in a linear, linear fashion. And I think the second is really the power of, um, of community, I would say uh, in terms of action. And we see that in terms of, um, uh, in how the pandemic has played out in a lot of different places. You know, I'm frustrated when people, we, when we say politics, you know, how do we convince the politicians? You know what the politicians need? Votes, right? So how much, how, how are we voting, right? Are we voting based on what we say is urgent or are we voting based on some other issues, right? So we do have to hold ourselves accountable to that. And then the third thing I would say is the, the, um, the dichotomy and the, that of the gap between research and advocacy, we need to get rid of that, right? Because there is this, you know, are you doing advocacy or are you doing, we, we don't have time for this, right? I often see you either have researchers who are, I'm oversimplifying obviously the ex exemptions, researchers who are doing an ex really interesting and important work, but it's just science. And speaks for itself problem you can see but are not connected to the the um the latest evidence and so it's somewhat superficial and somewhat solely on the emotive i think we have to bring together the emotive with the depth um and 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 i think universities and academic institutions have a critical role to play to examine to say well what are we doing right whilst we're saying well this is urgent how are we how are we shifting our systems into to, to value the kind of research that has that real world, real world, um, real world uh, impact. Thank you, Tolu. Uh, I think, you know, to be fair to our next speaker, I'm going to stop the questions there, but please share your questions in the chat box and we will pass them on to Tolu. Tolu, thank you so much for your time and we hope that you stay with us for the remainder of the session. Uh, uh, Prof. Wanda Makota, if you can please switch on your camera. And I, it is truly a pleasure to have you here today. I trolled you on the internet and I, I, I was blown away by some of your work. Uh, <laughs> she is the director of the Center for Viral Zoonoses, Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Pretoria. She occupies two research chairs, DSI NRF South African Research Chair Infectious Diseases, of animals and a chair in people, health and places at the Future Africa Institute. In 2021, she was appointed as the co-chair of the One Health High Level Expert Panel advising the WHO, OIE, FAO and UNEP. Her interdisciplinary research program focuses on bat pathogens and the risk of spillover in Southern Africa and it is supported by several multi-collaborative international viral surveillance programs. Uh, her talk today focuses on a holistic approach to pandemic preparedness. It is my privilege and pleasure to hand you now to Prof. Wanda Makata. Thank you, and, and thank you for that kind introduction. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Oh, and now I'm on the wrong slide. Let me just get to the first one. There we go. And so I'm going to try and be a bit quicker so that we have some time for discussion. I'm not going to talk about bats today. I'm, I'm going to give you a more broader overview on um, what's going on in terms of our thinking in terms of pandemic preparedness, and I've added the word prevention there in brackets because we all would like to prevent pandemics. But I think realistically, um, if we aim at prevention, we're gonna be better prepared. 
but to stop everything from happening is, is probably not the most realistic um, approach. So we all know now with the current COVID pandemic that the conversation started again. It's not a new conversation that we really need to look at a more coherent and coordinated action and approach on, on all levels. And, and this is um, including stakeholders, but it's also on all levels of communities and national and global approaches. So it also includes that. And it's, it's really not, like I said, something new, but it's, it's really this urgency. And I think um, Prof. Ani also mentioned that that there's an urgency to do things better going forward and really look at what worked, what didn't work, and how can we go forward in the best way possible. So just, just an overview of, of outbreaks and pandemics um, to put us into perspective, um, we know that there's been a lot of um, new outbreaks and pandemics in the last decade. And all indications, if you look at the what the scientists are predicting, um, it, is that we're going to see more, more outbreaks in the future. It's definitely not going to become less. And it comes from this existing diversity of micro, microbes that we have in nature. So it's not new pathogens that suddenly appear from nowhere. They're always there. But then there's certain factors that make these pathogens spill over into other animals and humans. And then we start seeing outbreaks and even pandemics if it starts spreading um, onto a global stage. It's mostly viruses, but there's also others. And what's important is that most of them are zoonoses, having an animal origin. Um, now, what's also quite, quite scary is if you look at some of the predictions that scientists are making, that there's over 1.7 million viruses that we still haven't identified and that they're actually predicting that more than half a million could potentially have the um, if, uh, probability of spilling over. Now, this is all predictions. Um, it, it's debatable if, if this is actually true, but we are sitting with this unknown diversity in nature that we're not exactly sure what it's going to do in the future. And then the important point, and I will talk a lot about this, is that contact um, spillover happened due to specific reasons. We have this diversity, but there needs to be contact. And that contact is, is some, most of the time due to anthropological factors that we will also look at today. Um, so I've already explained this now in my first slide, but we have this diversity. Um, it can be in wild animals. It can sometimes also be in domestic and livestock and other animals. And then it spills over to humans. And sometimes it will stop with one or two infections. But as we've seen with COVID-19, it started amplifying as a disease that spread between humans. And then if we have travel and, and all of that, it suddenly spread up to a global scale. So there's been all kinds of clever economic analysis. And this is just one example of, of an analysis that was done um, at the start of the COVID pandemic. So this actually, I think, looked even worse if we put in the new um, numbers, but we know for years, and this is analysis done by the World Bank, by some of the um, international agencies, that the cost of um, really reacting on a disease when it's already at a level where it's causing a lot of animal um, deaths or um, illnesses or even up to um, spilling over into humans are much higher than prevention. And, and this is just another example of that. And I like this example because if you look at it, yes, what is the cost of, of looking for viruses or detecting the disease and all of that? But also what is the cost of, of preventing other things like reducing deforestation that play a role in some of these spillover events? And then the benefits and the spill um, spin-offs of that uh, reducing deforestation is even broader than just the cost of preventing and um, reacting to um, zoonotic diseases. So there's definitely an economic advantage of doing this. It's just getting to that point where we're actually doing it and seeing the bigger picture. So if you look at factors of spillover, this is also just one example um, that was um, also used by the United Nations. 
Um, there's several factors, and they're not the same for every disease. They're not the same in every geographical area, which obviously make this a much complicated issue on how to react, because we can't have one global approach. We really need to go down to community and regional level to see what the issues really are. And in most cases, we don't even have the data, and we're extrapolating and modeling from other data in other parts of the world. So we know land use change, we know changes in agricultural industry, international travel, changes in medical and, and health, public health breakdowns, climate, we talked a lot about this in the first talk is important. And um, the human de demographic and behavior issues, population growth is very important also here. How we change the food industry and how we put our food on the table, things like bushmeat, has also become quite prominent. So what we can really see is that it, it becomes increasingly clear that the factors driving infectious diseases are mostly anthropogenic. It, it's due to human activity. So there's been quite a few um, uh, clever publications um, published in, in 2021, um, really looking at, at this as, as a more holistic picture. So, I've mentioned we've got pathogens in, in animals, and let's say it's wildlife here. We use bats as an example. They infected with this pathogen, this virus. And this is not just all the animals are infected all the time. This is already a complicated situation. You know, um, these infectious cycles and when the pathogen is actually excreted into the environment or into a as uh, fecal material or an oral um, saliva is, is not the same all the time. It's driven by things like the maternity um, cycles, um, the juveniles that doesn't have maternal immunity or losing it. So there's all kinds of complicated issues in the host. But what's becoming more and more clear is that external stresses, and this is typically ecological issues and environmental issues, can make this situation even worse and make this population shedding the pathogens more often in higher concentrations. And then obviously that has a higher risk for spillover and then ultimately spread. So environment and, and how the environment impact on these diseases are quite important. So if you look at um, the distribution of a wildlife host, because remember I also said at the beginning, there needs to be contact. So if we have things like habitat fragmentation and degradation, changes in how the ecological structure function, for instance, hydrology, and you completely change that environment, you immediately have a different movement of these animals and they can then come into contact um, with humans or other animals that can serve as amplifying hosts in, in a disease spillover situation. It can also influence the susceptibility of that specific host towards the disease, and then you can have more of the pathogen, higher um, titers, and it can easily um, or more easily spill over. So this is typically if, if the health is being influenced. So there's not natural resources, there's not enough food, then typically you have stress. Another important thing that, that's now becoming more and more prominent is introducing biological toxins and, and other pollutants um, from the environment into this um, complex interaction and also influencing the health of wildlife or other animals that, that may harbor these pathogens and then leading to, to higher prevalence and spillover. Then it's also important to look at how these pathogens survive outside of those. So if we change environmental conditions, it might improve the pathogen, or if there's a vector like a mosquito or a mitch involved, it can change that whole situation. And then human behavior is always a very important factor. If human behavior change in a way that there's more contact with these pathogens, there's obviously a higher risk. And then we also look at the health of humans. So if humans are more susceptible to infection, and this is typically looking at pre-existing conditions, healthcare, um, just good nutrition, food nutrition, all those factors play a role in, in this bigger picture to really have a healthy 
environment with people, environment, and, and animals in. So for a lot of years, and basically um, still now, the, the focus has very, been very much on pathogen detection. You know, the, the scientists and, and the researchers have always advised that we must know what is where, we must identify these pathogens, we must test for them. And then if we know in time, and we know where they are, and we detect them quickly if they spill over, then we will be in a better situation to prevent outbreaks and pandemics. But the, the whole um, rationale of the COVID-19 and, and the conversations has changed around, is this really enough? Should we just look for pathogens and try and detect them quickly and then react? Or should this be a, a bigger picture that we need to look at? Um, so the, the talk is really about what should we do to really prevent and be prepared and do differently? And maybe we should focus with the same level of intensity on all the factors that may be important in terms of pandemic preparedness and prevention. So I've, I've showed in the previous pictures that, that the host is always important. So we always need to understand the host and where these pathogens are and, and the life history, their movement, their biology, the ecology around that. But the other factors that I've also alluded to is, is really looking at anthropogenic factors, land use changes, animal markets, the global wildlife trade, Ill illegal or legal. Climate change, always an important factor that influences a lot of these issues. And then really also looking at the human behavior aspect in, in this bigger picture. So if we talk about um, going forward in terms of of preparedness and, and using the word surveillance, we really need to start looking at a realistic approach where the health of people is connected to the health of animals, plants, and the environment. And I didn't use the word right at the beginning, but in the global arena, this is now again very prominent, um, prominently explained as the One Health approach. The One Health approach has been with us for, for decades. Um, sometimes it, it's a more uh, important buzzword to use. Sometimes we use other terms, but what it basically is, is this holistic approach looking at all these connected aspects. And in the global arena, there's been quite a few initiatives. And, and I just got a, um, from the perspective um, from the One Health um, high level expert panel, just share a few of these um, initiatives and how it came about, and that there's really this conversation going on on a higher level on how to really implement a one out approach looking at pandemic preparedness and prevention in the future. So the, the Earlier panel, the one out um, high level expert panel advised four organizations um, simultaneously together, um, which is the FAO, OIE, UNI, and then the WHO. So, what's different from this is it's not just um, the tripartite, which is the FAO, OIE, and, UNIC, and WHO. UNEP is also now on board as an equal partner, bringing in really the environmental aspects that are um, really important. So just to, to put a bit into perspective, and some of you may be aware of these discussions, but One Health has really featured as a topic on a global level um, at the last um, high-level intergovernmental events at the G7, the G20 summit, the United Nations World Food Summit, and then several international and, and regional events. And all of these events really underlined that One Health um, needs to be a collective action and really building at all levels to reduce the risk of pandemics. That, that's been the, the, outcome, or the outcome that everybody is looking for. Um, and then there's been several governments and organizations that have called for further support um, of One Health um, policies at, at a global level, but also at the regional and country level through establishing of new One Health partnerships. And there's been this call for a high level expert panel to, to look at some of these aspects and, and really advise on what worked, what didn't work, how can we go forward 
um, to these um, four partner organizations. And there's been lots of initiatives globally um, on one out. There's been uh, additional surveillance initiatives, things like Freezo, Zodiac, and um, there's been um, one out intelligence hubs where they want to look at, at what we can do with the information, how we can communicate better globally and, and identify issues um, before um, there's actually a pandemic. So the panel was established um, in um, a few months ago, and they are already active, really looking at, at how we can advise on going forward in terms of One Health aspects, looking at all four partners and really bringing in the environment as an equal partner. So what this is really about is, is looking at this broader picture to support healthy people, healthy animals, and healthy ecosystems, but also addressing the underlying issues that play an important role in disease emergence and the spread, including social and economic issues. So one of the important things that's been brought into, into these discussions and expertise in those areas is also part of it is really the social sciences. And I think um, from, from the conversations globally and, and going forward, it's really been recognized that environmental and socioeconomic factors in disease emergence was not sufficiently integrated in the past. We talked about it. We said it's part about it, but it wasn't really integrated in what we do on the ground. And there's really this need going forward to implement this on, on all level, levels. Um, so to, I'm um, actually saving a lot of time, this is my, my last slide. Um, so just to recap my thoughts, it's, it's really about using the information already available, the lessons learned um, from the past going forward um, and really translating into action. So, so we need to make the communication of how this needs to happen very practical. It, can't, it, it obviously needs to be a policy level and a political level discussion, but on the ground, it needs to be practical. People need to understand what they can do to actually implement this on the ground. And in addition, um, there will always be a need for what we will call biosurveillance, looking, looking at where there's pathogens, trying to identify them better. But we must also recognize there will always be a disease X that we've missed. We can't test for 1.7 million viruses and know exactly where they occur and when they're going to spill over or if they can spill over. So that is one part that we need to continue with, but it's, it's one part of the puzzle. It's, it's not the most important part. And one of the discussions that's, that's going on is really looking at one health surveillance. Um, and this is maybe not the correct term yet to use, but um, I'm using it in lack of a better term at this point. But if we look at pathogen surveillance, we also need to look at collecting data for all these other factors that's important in spillover. And that's got to do with the ecosystem, with the environment. And we need to have a way of putting all of that together. Because a lot of this data is lying on a researcher's desk or computer, and it's not out there for people to use. So we really need to build that systems where we can put all the data together and share it with the aim of preventing pandemics and being prepared but also with the aim of having a healthier planet. The data is not just there for disease prevention. It, it's got so many other spin-offs. If, if you really look at, at the advantages of improving what we do with the environment and the issues that we have. So there needs to be this basic understanding of the pathogens, but then the reasons for spillover is, is also important. And a lot of times we think we know these reasons, we've got these lists, but it's very non-geographic specific. We really don't know what's going on in the, on the ground in most regions of the world. So it has to be very geographic specific data, and that then has to follow with very specific mitigation actions for that specific problem. Also thinking, what will be the effect of, for instance, stopping bushmeat? It's not so easy to just say, 
let's stop bushmeat. We need to look at alternatives then for nutrition in certain areas. So it becomes a bigger complex picture that's not just about disease prevention in the end. So it's really an interdisciplinary and interinstitutional sectoral global approach, not just about pandemics, but with several other spin-offs, spin several other spin-offs and advantages to several other disciplines. And, and we can actually work together towards healthier humans, healthier animals, and a healthier planet and preventing pandemics and being better prepared in the future. Thank you. That was the end. I'll open that up to the chairs. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Sorry, I'm having connectivity issues on my side. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, colleagues, uh, I want to uh, now ask Wanda uh, and Tolu to perhaps, uh, after listening to each other's talk, uh, try to find what is the marriage of ideas uh, that has emerged between both of you and whether you see any synergies in terms of approach to the challenge that we've posed in the series around why environmental management must become the new normal. I think in, in many cases, we, we, we find ourselves in webinars preaching to the converted. Uh, and I'm so happy that both of you move towards action. Uh, so I would want to give each of you a minute or two to perhaps re reflect on each other's talks and whether there is a marriage of ideas emerging from both the talks. Uh, Tolu first. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, uh, Prof. Marketer, for this really just incredible uh, thought-provoking uh, talk and reflections. One thing that really stood out for me, lots of things. <laughs> One of the things that really stood out for me was around what you were saying around surveillance, right? Because this is, you know, it's been really such a bugbear of mine as well, you know, especially coming from a health space where you have a lot around kind of demographic and health surveillance, and there's things happening elsewhere, but it's completely disconnected. Um, and reflecting on the fact that, you know, I don't, my work doesn't include, say, animals. And so really, I would say the bottom line of this is around the data infrastructure um, that allows a modular approach to add because sometimes we try and do everything and then, you, and then you bring some oh should we add this should we add this and then you spend the next five years just thinking about all the things it should it should comprise and by the time you're done with it it should be okay should we should have all the data in the world ever on everything you know, and then it's just like, okay, where do we start? So, but the critical thing I think that really struck me from your talk um, and the commonality um, is, is the need for this integrated data infrastructure, right? That allows space. So, you know, I'm sure somebody else will come up with, oh, there's another aspect that neither of you have talked about, but that's okay. If we have a space that is flexible and is responsive and is built in a way that allows that to grow um, um, and allows the um, analysis and that systems approach to be taken. So I think that for me, that's one of the really critical things that, that, that stood out as a... Wanda, yeah. if I can ask you to come in. Yes, uh, I think uh, communication mm, and having no cost -cost shared... Point. Sorry, um, are you hearing me? Um, so, so communication and sharing of data is, is probably the first thing that we should improve. You know, even just with what we already have, we're not doing very well with communication and, and sharing data. Um, so that's already the first thing. And, and we, we've been battling with this on a high level. You know, how do you design a plan like this? Because if you go to a government or even 
uh, to a community and you say, listen, you need to implement this one now, it's impossible. People are going to be like, we can't do all of this. And I, I think it will be a staggered approach to get to that point. But what we in agreement about um, in our conversations is that at least everybody must sit around the same table when we plan activities. And even if we can't do everything from the beginning, the conversations need to be inter and transdisciplinary from the beginning. Because then we're going to know what we should do in the future. We're probably going to realize what's the most important things that should be done. And, and I think another important thing um, you work a lot with communities on it is from the disease perspective, we also need to work from the community level. We need to understand communities and what's the real problem and work from that level upwards. Obviously, we need all the support from the top downwards to do this. But the conversations and the planning need to be from that ground level upwards. Thank you. Thank you both for that. And I just want to tag on to a point that you made about we are all sitting around the table. And before I move to the house for questions, uh, there, yes, there is value in transdisciplinarity in conversation and in approach. However, there are some serious challenges around trying to set global as opposed to regional goals around sustainability. And we are seeing this with the, the huge call from many parts around the world to revisit the sustainable development goals. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the 2050 uh, assessment, uh, there are calls for it to be scrapped entirely, uh, given that some countries have actually retrogressed in terms of their progression towards the SDGs. Uh, and, and, and I wonder why, whether there is a limit to the value of inclusivity. Uh, but, and I'm talking about this in the global scale whether we need to go back towards regionally set goals uh, that are in line with global ambitions, but not necessarily global goals. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. It's, it's a difficult one. Um, so, so really to have support, and I mean about financial support, buy-in of governments, buy-in of big organizations, there needs to be a global common goal. It can be very broad. And I agree with you at regional level, it might look, look different, but I think it's, it's this broader goal with more specifics on a regional level, if, if I have to, to think about it. But I, I don't think every region can now go and have a completely different aim because We've seen with COVID, the world's connected. So yeah. in some way, we need to have the same mindset of where we want to go with our future. But the specifics of how we do it might be different. Okay. Tolu? Yes, I think I'm, I'm inclined to agree with that because, well, two comments. Firstly, is that um, uh, it's already a problem if the global and the regional uh, not um, speaking to each other because I think it, it for me it flags the inclusivity and power dynamic of reaching global agreements right um, who has a seat at the table globally right and how much to what extent is does that the global agreements reflect um, realities in different contexts by virtue of the heterogeneity across different regions I think global agreements cannot be and should not be too detailed in terms of depth because the application is, as um, what Mark alluded to, the application is going, the priority setting is going to differ in different contexts. Um, but what, um, so we, we've recently just done some work looking at um, the ways that uh, global um, policies around um, diet and physical activity and from an intersectoral space of food environment and built environment, how that reflects from the global kind of SDG level to the um, Africa 
a regional level to the national level to the city's levels and you know they're not they don't um disagree right because actually a lot of the high level um, ish, um agreements are not very detailed there is a missed opportunity at the global i, I would say the, the critical issue actually is the missed opportunity at the regional level to set the agenda that is representable the regional and to be yeah. more detailed because often yeah. the regional agenda is also as fuzzy and as high yeah. level. That for yeah. me is actually more of a critical problem yeah. because as a region, you have no excuse. I understand why global can be superficial, but why do we have an AU agenda we want by 2063 that has these lofty goals? And then when you look at the action plan, where is that? You know, we have this conversation that that piece I showed the African Development Bank. Yeah. You know, how do you start actually? looking at the priorities and, and yeah. putting some meat on it we have no no yeah. excuse I and mean, that uh, that is much more critical to me yeah i mean you just have a case of the the a different tailor but the emperor is still naked uh so so if i can move the conversation now to the uh, <laughs> to, to if if i can move the conversation now to the house and call for any questions in the house kolani if you can help me to see any raised hands. Uh, there are over 50 participants, so it's quite difficult to navigate through all, all of them. Uh, the, so to the house, the, the floor is yours if you have a question. Myvin Howard, you have a question? Marvin, you are on mute. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to the um, presenters and the host. Uh, I did post my question in the chat. I think it's almost easier, um, Sershan, if you read off the chat um, the question yeah, that I posed yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the question is, concerns surrounding COVID circulating in unvaccinated reservoir populations of humans uh, uh, Asia, Africa, South, South America, potentially uh, immunocompromised and infected with other viruses. What is the potential of mutation and variant evolution to more aggressive infectious strains? Um, uh, I, I think we, we have seen that in some of the variants that are arising, uh, the Delta variant being a case in point, uh, but Wanda, if you want to very briefly take this further. Yeah, so I think specifically with RNA viruses and, and Corona is one of them, um, the more they, they replicate, the more mistakes they build into their genomes, so the more chance we give them to replicate in communities the more chances there will be for mutations. Not every mutation will make it a more severe virus. It can also be the other way around, but we're increasing that, that probability. So it's, it's definitely not a good situation to have this level of, of replication wherever it is. Um, and and that, that's why we're trying to vaccinate as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, and not have this whole um, replication cycles going on. And it's been shown with, with some of the scientific publications that there's definitely more severe variants coming out of, of some of these regions. And, and I think it will continue as long as we have replication of the virus to a high level. Um, in short, that, that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. Uh, if there are no other burning questions, uh, I would like to bring this series to an end. We've had four weeks of very, very stimulating discussions, and I'm certain that the two talks of today will receive many, many hits on our YouTube channel. So please feel free to share the video uh, of the uh, talks uh, via the YouTube link that will be shared with you. I want to thank, uh, from the bottom of my scientific heart, uh, Tolu and Wanda for joining us today. I think we ended with two superb talks. And uh, even if 
there isn't uh, the 50% threshold of women at the next COP. We have a 100% threshold reached today in terms of our speakers. Thank you so much uh, to everyone that attended the talk. Go well, be safe, and think scientifically. Bye. Thank you. Bye.